Yeah. I have a couple of questions for you, uh, Kathleen, that are from yep. the chat. Uh, we'll start okay. with the last one because it's at the bottom of my screen. In the case that a hip or shoulder armpit has severe hemorrhaging, how is that approached? I've heard of specialized tourniquets Will we be equipped with those? I know that you will not be able to answer about the specialized tourniquets as far as whether they have them, but how would you approach that? So those are really hard to deal with because they're really hard to you. First of all, a regular tourniquet won't work and they're really hard to even, uh, cause it's a, you know, it's like a web space, right? So it's really hard to apply pressure. So if it was like in their armpit, I think the best thing you could do would be uh, compression and pinching. Um, in the groin, um, if it's a small laceration, you can do direct pressure. Uh, for instance, um, like two fingers of pressure is better than your whole hand putting pressure on it. Uh, so two fingers is, you know, like at, right at the laceration, even if your fingers on the laceration would stop it better than you putting the palm of your hand on it. But those are hard, those are very hard to stop. Uh, yeah, I think probably the answer, Ryan, is that, boy, you're just going to do the best you can unless you have some of those special tourniquets, which I would be very surprised to hear. No yeah. one, I don't think anyone has those. No. I don't even know if, yeah, yeah. No. Uh, I, 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 like I said, I would be surprised if you have it, but you're just going to do the best you can and remembering that packing anything you can pack and putting as much pressure as you can, that's what you're gonna to have to do. And it's just a hard place. Plus, if you're trying to transport them, uh, you know, what do you do with their arm? And you're just gonna to have to take each situation and do your very, very best. Okay, the like next- if, if it was a femoral injury, like a, uh, you know, your femoral artery, you would have, someone would have to literally hold pressure on that you know, like transport down in the helicopter because those would just bleed and bleed and bleed. Especially if they were anticoagulated. Right, right, right. Okay, the next question, I don't know the answer to, and maybe you do, Kathleen. Uh, someone asked, why did they change the name from flail chest? What was the matter with that? Uh, in my opinion, there was nothing. Flail chest is much more descriptive. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. so I have no idea why they did. The, the answer I gave, you know, and I wanted to see if you had a better answer, was that medical people love to change the names to make it confusing for the next generation and for everyone on the outside. It makes, I think some people, it makes them feel like they know more than everybody else because <laughs> they, you know, you say, well, what's that? And it's the new name for that. So you and right. I agree on that. But I uh, think that if I was calling in a report, I would still say flail chest. Okay, there you go. Yeah. The next question, someone asked, if you are packing a wound, is it painful when you're doing that to the patient? Yes, very. Yeah, that, I, I, that's what I said. I said, if they are conscious, it's very, very painful. I don't know if any of you have had even a minor wound packed. You know, all the nerves are in the layers above and so you're going through those and you're putting pressure on them and they're already irritated because you've sliced them and diced them. Yeah, it's very painful. And that's opposed to if we were to open you up and touch certain things on the inside of your body, you would just have this vague feeling because the nerves there aren't meant to provide the same warnings that nerves that are on the outside of your body are. You know, nerves and pain are actually a defense mechanism that something's happening that you don't want it to happen. Yeah. So a very long answer to your questions. Okay, Kathleen, uh, you know, what, one of the things I always do at the end, if you were going to give uh, our patrollers a couple take homes from this, uh, I've got mine, what, what would yours be? Um, that they changed the ABCD to X ABCD, so exsanguination first, and um, they're really pushing hemorrhage control. Okay, great, great. You know, I, that was on my list too. The other parts of my list are actually more generalized to remember that in trauma, you know, the concept that I always try and tell you about the snapshot, the moment in time versus the movie versus what happens over time is really, really important. And you monitoring vital signs, monitoring 
neurologic status, monitoring color, respiration, all those things, and seeing what's happening should alert you to how fast you want to go. But with yeah. trauma, you always want to be thinking ahead, always thinking, you know, what's the worst thing that could happen and how am I prepared for it? As well as always looking for the other more important thing, you know, we deal with a lot of people who have painful trauma, but we don't let someone's, you know, broken leg that the bones are sticking out, you know, not let us notice that they also have a flail chest and are having difficulty breathing. So, right. And, and so on that note, Winnie, the flail chest, that's why I put that video in. That is yeah. such a huge thing. And you, that's so easy. You could just put your hand on the chest and make sure both sides are rising with inspiration. Very good, very good. And then the other take home, again, is more general to what you all do, which is, you know, every time you're on a scene, you want to be thinking, what do I need? Who do I need? And where am I going? And how do I get there? And the th with trauma, you need to make some of those decisions more quickly than in other, with major trauma, you need to be thinking of those all sort of simultaneously to how fast do I need to get them out? And, you know, do we need a helicopter or can we go by ground? Right, so, scene, quick scene assessment and right. And get them, get them out of there if they got trauma. The, the other thing that you told me tonight that was very interesting, Kathleen, I'm sort of mulling it over my head about, you know, cause we don't obviously don't have blood or even have blood all that close about giving how much fluids, you know, that sounds very different obviously than what we always did where we wanted to, if they were bleeding out, we put as much fluid in as we could. Right, and so, so that's, that's a very different change, yep. That's a, that's a real big change. And the nice thing to know is that, you know, we do have blood at the hospital and we do have blood products there. So we're a little bit better off than we were before a hospital. But again, if someone is hurting, we wanna get them there quickly. And exsanguination, we wanna stop the bleeding as best we can and give them that liter or a liter and a half of fluid and get them out. The other thing, Kathleen, for you, um, at the refresher that was done this past Saturday and the one that will happen next Saturday, uh, the fire department was kind enough to come over and they ran the arrest scene uh, such, the, the, you know, the patrollers practiced their arrest skills and then the ambulance took over and they showed off all their fancy equipment among which was the video laryngoscope. It was the first time I had ever seen it. So our ambulances actually have the real fancy ones. They, have, they also have the fancy thing that, that does all your compressions for you. It, it's wow. amazing. So, I mean, soon we're gonna have an automatic car that drives itself and, and I don't know, there'll probably be a lift that takes the patient in. There won't be anyone in the back, just a bunch of machines. But, <laughs> but, but we are pretty up to date, so that's good. Yeah, that's so, amazing. So with that, um, before we leave, does anyone have any other questions that we haven't answered? Well, Tove put one on there and just said that Air Med also carries uh, blood products. They oh, yeah, do. Yeah. You have bleeding. Oh, patients. they do. Wow, that's I didn't know that. that. That's that's real good to know. Thank you, Tove. I didn't know that either. So once again, you know the concept of that we are a, an urban ski area versus a rural ski area, we are really, really lucky. Because if you're at Taos, New Mexico, or even, you know, uh, Big Sky where Kathleen has a condo, you know, they're far enough away that some of the things that we'll be able to salvage, they won't be able to. Yeah. Anyone else have any comments or questions? And if not, we're gonna let you have a little early night tonight and we will get the half recording to those people who missed the first part. The second half is still good. And Sue is going to try and figure out how to get you Toph the stuff eventually that tells who was kind enough to join us tonight. So anything else? If not, we're going to let everybody go. Have a good night. Well, I, I was just wondering, uh, Kathleen and uh, Winnie, do you think we should just like plop through the first um, slides so that yeah. I can yeah, get yeah. those. So where, where did we lose, where did we lose uh, my voice? Um, well, from the beginning. So start from the beginning and then maybe slowly just, I don't think you need to talk about them, but maybe just put them up there. 
and then we probably should do the at least the uh, flail chest video that you have. And and I'm sorry that I wasn't on top of that. It, it, let's see. It was right after the flail chest that we came on. So yeah, if you want to run. Yeah. So you guys didn't cool. hear. No one heard the whole first part. No, they. Everyone that's on the recording heard everything. Oh, good. Okay. Okay. Hang on one sec. Let me just go back. Okay. Because I threw all my papers on the floor. Hang on. Okay, so we'll go back to just a sec. Let me just get organized here. So that one we did. I like that flail chest video. I know, good. and it was pretty much right after that that I went, oh my gosh, the recording isn't on. So okay. so Kathleen, let me or Sue, let me say something. It looks like we still have 19 people on. And you're more than welcome to stay for a second round, but we're gonna run through the first part of this. Uh, and otherwise we'll see you later. Okay, so needle placement, we have that shock initial assessment. Okay, I'm gonna start over. Okay, so okay. up to flail chest soup. Just yeah, I, I do know for sure it was right where you were doing the tourniquet on uh, on, on Christy. The, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like okay. most of it, right? <laughs> Sorry about right. that. So uh, airway. Okay. okay, let me say a few words here. Are we starting? Uh, uh, are you ready? Are you guys ready? Or yeah, go to the yeah, very go to your very beginning go to your very beginning slide. Okay. All right. Initial, this is Kathleen Thomas, and this is an update on um, the changes to the 2021 advanced trauma life support. So initial assessment, move to blood products as soon as possible. Standards are changing due to evidence-based research. Uncontrolled hemor hemorrhage is now treated immediately after establishing scene safety, and it is done before addressing airway. The golden hour is not a strict 60 minutes, but a concept used to emphasize the importance of transporting trauma patients as fast as possible. The major cause of potentially preventable life is uncontrolled hemorrhage. Restriction to only infusing one liter of IV fluid, is, which is usually normal saline, which this is a big change. Infusion of more than 1.5 liters of IV fluid has been now shown to increase mortality and trauma. Massive transfusions are now recommended, like four units of blood in one hour or 10 units in 24 hours. Large amounts of IV fluid can cause dilutional coagulopathy, cardiac complications, electrolyte imbalances, and hypothermia. Airway and ventilation. Short-acting drugs used for intubation with gag reflex, and that would be something like propofol or ketamine. And you would use something like this and decrease level of consciousness, intoxication, traumatic uh, injury, and the inability to adequately ventilate non-invasive non -invasive ventilation, you know, like bag valve mask or something. Uh, the main side effect of using these medications is low blood pressure. Uh, a new thing that we ha we've had for a couple of years, which is now um, used in the ambulance and everywhere else, is video laryngoscopes, which are really cool. They're little handheld um, laryngoscopes, but they have a light with a video on it, so you can watch the ET tube go through the vocal cords, and then you know you're intubating in the right place. And here's a picture of it. So it's great, and so you know when you're putting that in. You're trying to be careful of the teeth and you don't have to look away. You just look right at that little screen. Shock. Shock is a lack of oxygen to organs and tissues. There, I'm gonna go over the different types of shock. Hypovolemic shock, which is lack of blood. Anaphylactic shock, which is um, allergic, like a bee sting or something, or maybe somebody ate peanuts. Septic shock is an infection, usually bacterial. A neurogenic shock is from um, head injury. There's also cardiogenic shock is when the heart can't pump properly. Like if somebody had chest trauma and they had cardiac tamponade where the pericardial flat sac fills up with blood and then the muscle can't contract properly. 
No matter what type of shock it is, it presents the same way. Increased heart rate, decreased blood pressure, cool, pale skin, restlessness, anxiousness, and possibly unconsciousness. Something new in shock is transexemic acid. And it's a um, IV infusion. And some uh, people, probably paramedics and stuff, carry this. It works by slowing down the breakdown of blood clots. And it's recommended to be used within three hours. And this would be, you know, in a big trauma patient who's bleeding. The side effects of it are deep vein thrombosis, you know, things that cause uh, clotting, deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, and stroke. In the field, you can control shock by controlling bleed, or you can decrease shock by controlling bleeding, high flow oxygen, prevention of heat loss, and rapid transport. Thoracic trauma. The term flail chest has been replaced by tracheal bronchial tree injury, which is a mouthful. Life-threatening thoracic injuries include tracheal bronchial tree injury, which is flail chest, which is a fracture of three or more contiguous ribs, airway obstruction, tension pneumothorax, open pneumothorax, or massive hemothorax, like cardiac tamponade. And now I'm going to show you my video of flail chest. Let me just, okay, here it is. You can see the paradoxical motion of the chest. When he's breathing in, it's going down instead of up. And I think that video is good because that's something that, like if somebody crashed in the park and landed on their chest, you could easily just put your hand on their chest. And if both sides are not rising with inspiration, you can think, okay, they've got at least three rib fractures. Needle placement decompressed, needle placement to decompress pneumothorax has changed. So in adults, it's now the fourth or fifth intercostal space mid axillary line. In kids, it's still the second intercostal space mid clavicular line. And here's a picture of that. And I think a lot of people have been moving more towards that, um, uh, the fourth or fifth intercostal space on adults. Abdominal and pelvic trauma. Prostate exam is no longer recommended when you're trying to decide if someone has a pelvic fracture. Uh, so everyone can stop doing that. Uh, <laughs> retro or Pre-peritoneal pelvic packing is included in the hemorrhage protocol. Pelvic packing is done in hemodynamically unstable severe pelvic fractures. And that is done in the uh, operating room. They cut the abdomen open, they move the bladder over and they pack sponges between the uh, pelvic ring and the peritoneum. Looking for abdominal injury and unexplained shock. Look for abdominal, excuse me, gray Turner sign is uh, flank bruising. Here's a picture of it. And that's from sub Q blood running under the skin. Here's a couple other pictures of it. And now um, my abdominal wound packing. So Sue, did you get this? Uh, no, keep going. Okay, here's a video of my abdominal wound uh, packing. I did this last year, but I thought it was pertinent so you get to watch it again. This is my pork shoulder with a very deep wound. This wound is too large and too deep to just apply direct pressure, so I'm going to have to pack it. There is a lot of blood in the wound and I cannot see the bottom. I am going to do a quick finger sweep There's some squirting blood, but I can feel the bottom of the wound. So I'm gonna take my Curlex. You can pack it with Curlex or you can pack it with gauze four by fours, but I happen to have this and this is easy to remove once they get to the hospital. So I'm going to just pack this in the wound as tight as I can. By doing this, it applies pressure to the little tiny arteries and puts pressure on them so they stop bleeding. So I'm going to pack it tight as I can. And then I'm going to put a compression dressing on it. Hold direct pressure now that it's packed. I'm going to hold direct pressure till it quits bleeding. If it keeps bleeding, I will just add more four by fours. When it stops bleeding, I'm going to continue to hold pressure while one of my co-workers wraps Curlex around the wound 
if it's uh, too big to wrap Curlex around it, you can put a four by four and try to create pressure that way. Continue holding direct pressure till it stops. And something I thought of after I did this video is instead of cutting that roll of Curlex off, you can leave it on top of the wound and then stretch your tape over it. And that would create a pressure dressing and that would work really nicely. Hang on, sorry. I'm gonna be sorry. careful. I'm gonna... I think you can just end there. We go. Christy, when you're at Christy, I think you can stop there. Unless you want to go through the whole thing, I'm. I'm. If getting... it's what whatever is easy for you, Sue. Do you want me to finish? Sure. I. I okay, I'll just finish. Okay. Okay. Pelvic binder or sling. The use of a binder or sling for suspected pelvic fracture to decrease bleeding. And I put this in because it needs to go around the greater trochanteric process of the, of the femur. And so it's a lot lower. You don't put it up around the iliac crest. It's, it's a lot lower than you would think. And if somebody has that, you also have to uh, do a lift instead of rolling them. Head trauma. Anticoagulation reversible table is now included in trauma treatment. We now have a lot of anticoagulated patients and most are elderly. We're living a lot longer and more active. So you've got to uh, think that the person that you're treating could be anticoagulated. We have uh, good anticoagulation medication now. Okay, the Glasgow Coma Scale. Some terms have changed. If you can't score a category, you use NT, not testable. testable. The Glasgow Coma Scale came from the University of Glasgow in 1974 and is used worldwide. And here is a picture of it. A, a normal score is 15. And you can look at this, but the big change in this is the motor response to elicit a motor response from somebody who appears to be unconscious. We are no longer supposed to use a sternal rub due to it causes soft tissue damage and the responses aren't predictable or reliable. So you now use let me go to that screen. Fingertip pressure, trapezius pinch, or superorbital notch pressure, right, right below the eyebrow. Um, with head injury, you can look at signs for skull fracture. This is battle signs, which is bruising behind the ear. And this is raccoon eyes. And these signs can take a day or two to appear. Spine and spinal cord trauma. It's now recommended to use the Canadian Cervical Spine Rule, CCR, and the National and or the National Emergency X-Radiology Utilization Study, Nexus, as a guideline to clear cervical spine injuries. So this is the first one, okay? And so first you think any high-risk thing. Patient is over 65 a big dangerous mechanism of injury, or they have paresthesias in their extremities. If they have any of those, they have to have a C-spine immobilization and they need a CT scan. Any low risk fractures, or excuse me, factors. So any of these, if they have these, then they probably don't have a problem. Uh, simple rear-ended motor vehicle accidents. They're sitting up in the emergency room. They are ambulatory at any time. Um, delayed onset of neck pain. That would be like somebody who perhaps fell forward and kind of had a whiplash of their neck and they were fine. And now today they hurt, you know, the next day. And that usually is from, you know, muscle pain, like their sternocleidomastoid muscles uh, An absence of C-spine tenderness. So if they um, are good there and they've been doing any of those, then you look and see if they can rotate their neck 45 degrees to the left and right. And if they can do that, then you can clear them. The one I like a little bit better is this one. It's a little bit more simple. Oops, sorry. There we go. Um, so the nexus criteria is uh, neurological defect present. If they have that, they need to be immobilized and get a CT. Midline spine tenderness, altered level of consciousness, intoxication, or distracting injury present. For instance, if they have a femur fracture or something that's giving them a lot of pain, they may not realize that their neck hurts. Uh, change in term, spinal immobilization. Term replaced with spine motion restriction. This is another thing like flail chest, right? 
uh, we try to avoid the use of backboards over two hours to decrease the risk of skin ulcers. Musculoskeletal trauma. The use of tourniquet to control severe bleeding is now recommended, not a last resort. And this is my tourniquet video. And I included this because you may have to use it, although it's an unusual case, but you may have to use it. Okay. I came upon a skier who is unconscious. She's breathing, she won't wake up, and I see blood pooling from underneath her pants. So I'm going to explore the wound. And it looks like she's like squirting blood out of her femoral artery. So I'm going to hold pressure here, which is a pressure point on her femoral artery. And I'm gonna have somebody get the tourniquet. So someone's holding pressure, I've got my tourniquet. This is a life-threatening wound. She's lost a lot of blood. Before applying the tourniquet, always remember you can try direct pressure and see if that will stop the bleeding. But in some cases, it won't and you have to use your tourniquet, which can be life-saving. So you're gonna apply your tourniquet. What? While somebody's holding pressure there. You can hold pressure here at the, if you have two people, you can hold pressure here at the, over the femoral artery and over the wound. So you're gonna apply it two inches, two to three inches above the wound, proximal to the wound. Tighten it up. And then you take this and you twist it until the bleeding stops. Then you secure it and you tighten that down. If the patient was awake, you tell them that this is gonna hurt a lot and once you put it on, we cannot take it off. Then you're going to label the time of day that it was put on. Some people will put a Sharpie, will write a T and write the time on the patient's forehead and then you need to get them to uh, the hospital. You can apply a tourniquet for up to two hours without doing ischemic damage to the extremity. You never take the tourniquet off, ever. Thermal injuries. Okay, fluid resuscitation for burns has been adjusted. And it, they're doing it now uh, per kilogram, uh, how big the person is, but that's not really something you have to worry about. Huge fu fluid loss due to capillary leak needs to, you need to start IV fluid immediately or they can die from shock. And it's a lot of fluid, like an amazing amount. P. Karen traumatic brain injury algorithm. This algorithm is used to identify traumatic brain injury and a need for CT scan. Okay, so under two years old, all altered mental status, scalp hematoma, loss of consciousness over five seconds, severe mechanism of injury, palpable skull fracture, and abnormal behavior per parent. And I've seen a couple examples of this. I had one kid who came in with his parents, but his friend was with him. And um, uh, the friend said, well, maybe he wasn't wearing a helmet and maybe he hit a tree. And sure enough, the kid had a uh, a boggy spot on his scalp and he had a scalp fracture and um, you know he had a headache and vomiting and uh, he also had blood behind his eardrums and then another one with the abnormal behavior was a day after the head injury the kid seemed fine and then the next day was kind of a bit uh, uh, staring off into space and a, uh, kind of dazed and confused uh, between two and 18 years old altered mental status, loss of consciousness, history of vomiting, clinical signs of basal skull fracture, which would be like that battle sign um, and the raccoon eyes, uh, severe mechanism of injury or severe headache. Uh, geriatric trauma, lower threshold to image elderly with these pre-existing conditions. Cirrhosis, coagulopathy, COPD, ischemic heart disease and diabetes, they know that uh, people with these conditions have a two-fold increase in mortality. And then last, transfer to definitive care using the SBAR tool. And I think this is, uh, they use this just trying to uh, get people to be, um, uh, to communicate more effectively. 
So the situation, what's happening, the background, the assessment and the recommendation. For instance, they have C midline C-spine tenderness. We've got them on a backboard. Uh, they need to be uh, have more advanced care. And that's it. Okay. Okay, uh, Kathleen. Kathleen. Yep. That was just fantastic. Really. Oh, really thank good. you. Thank you. I've already gotten a bunch of good comments. And, and the Sue, reason why I kept, I did it all the way through, Sue, is because then you don't have to splice it. Well, unfortunately, it's real important that we have the beginning and the end.